All right. Thank you for attending Worldwide Slot Car Chat on Zoom. We are at episode 54 today. I'm your host, Greg Gout. Gang's all here. We got Steve, <laughs> Petrucci, Leo, Alan, John, Don, Mike, Nick, Jeremy, Marks, and other people in the list. Uh, and we will chat about slot cars. Yes, we will do the giveaway drawing today on this chat, but I'm going to make you wait a little while before we do that. Uh, so as usual, let's start with uh, show and tell. Does anybody have any new cars, new projects, continuing projects, completed projects, anything you'd like to show and share or talk about, plug as a business entrepreneurial endeavor? Uh, I'm not seeing anybody jumping up and down, so I will go ahead and dig into my topic list. Actually, no, one. this one I didn't write down because I just thought of it this morning. There was a, uh, John Albright was his name on one of the Facebook groups, posted a picture of an old slot at Group C car that he said he did, an, he did a refresh on and said it was a car that he bought, you know, like back in 2006, one of the first slot at Group C cars, probably one of the first slot at cars, the Castrol uh, XJR11 or whatever the one with the, the wheel wheel coverage on the back end. Uh, great car, obviously. They started out as great cars. But I asked him what was his what did he do to refresh it? And I was going to, you know, make some suppositions, you know, oh, did you do this, 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 and this? But I'm like, no, I'll just leave it up to him to say what he did as a refresh. So I'm gonna I'm gonna turn that back on you guys and say, let's say you had a car that you have not been racing recently. You 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 got it and you did some stuff that you knew how to do you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, five years ago, whatever it was, this was early in your slot racing, you know, history, and then decided to bring that car back into your rotation or, you know, for whatever reason, because you wanted to, because you have a racing series or whatever, <laughs> what would be some of the things you're likely to have to do this time around that you didn't do before and or what would you do just as a matter of course on any car that's been sitting around for a while? Is there anybody who'd like to start on that? Go ahead, Martin. I change the tires. Change the tires. Because almost <laughs> certainly any tire is going to be needing treatment or has flat spots or is the entirely wrong kind of tire or is dried out. What about you, Nick? <laughs> uh, I'd strip the chassis down, make sure the chassis is flat and rebuild the whole thing from bottom up. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much a complete strip down and rebuild. Yeah. Even if it was just for fun on your home track, not for competition? Oh, if it was just for like a home track, then yeah, just tires like Martin said. But yeah, if you're going to go club racing, then really you need to start from the ground up. If it's been sat for a while, you know, something might have got in the motor calm. You, you don't know. Depends where it's been stored. So basically a full blueprinting as if it was a brand new car that you had just purchased for, for club racing, yeah. For club racing, yeah, yeah. That's the answer. Yeah, really. It's just for home race use, Greg. As I say, you know, if you've got a little PP3 battery, just to test the motors working, um, you probably want some new braids on it, or, you know, even just to clean them. And then just basically check that everything's lubricated and rotates nicely. A um, little bit of body rot. Um, put it on the track. Um, as Martin said, you know, if it's got the original tyres on it that are 15, 20 years old, they might have gone a bit hard. So if it's got some screw set wheels on it, pop, you know, pop a current set of um, tyres that you're using on the track, you know, comparable to another car that you're running. And, you know, um, then you start getting to thinking, oh, um, that's got the old 25K motor in it. And, you know, it's not as good as the modern one. So, um, you know, possibly you want to swap motor over. It's, it's only a five minute job, isn't it? You know. So, so let's flip the script on this one. I think pretty much we're all going to come to the same. We're going to basically say very much the same things as far as what we're going to do to that car. Stuff that we do now, right? The, so let's flip that around. What, what might you have done 10 or 15 years ago that was a, not a good idea that you would like take it? You, might you take a car out of your long-term storage and say, what was I thinking? This is a I mean, controversial one. Okay, go ahead, John. Oh, I, I, I was, I, I was oh Underwood, say, sorry, John Underwood. Go oh, John, oh, sorry. 
yeah, take the lead out of it. As you know, I, I, I don't race with a lot of lead, but I know a lot of people do. And But, you know, to me, it's um, <clears throat> I take it out, you know. No, that's a but, good one. In fact, I, I've seen a lot of people posting on Facebook and YouTube and stuff with their tuning, and it's like big slabs of lead all over the chassis. And the, I'm, the first thing I do is just roll my eyes. Okay, this guy is <laughs> on the newish side and still, still thinks that, you know, I mean, obviously you want your center of gravity low, but that's not necessarily the best way to achieve it all. Well, you know what? Th th those people are probably golfers. <laughs> because they got all that lead tape. They're just like, yeah, let's put it in the slot car. <laughs> yeah, they're just trying to overcompensate for the magnet. Didn't, it, yeah. I, didn't, didn't I speak to Chris Walker? Hold on. Had a, a car on one of the forums. Start oh, over Chris Walker one. had one on the... Yeah, Chris Walker had a car on one of the forums. I think he's quite an established proxy racer, racer, etc. And yeah, he puts great big squares or triangles of lead into the motor pod and stuff. And clearly, you know, it works for him. It doesn't work for, for everyone. For a okay. proxy, though. You know, so... Yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. So all I I know I heard Chris. Yeah, Chris is on here. Chris, I'm going to guess that you're more likely to put more lead in a proxy car than in a car that you would be racing around yourself. Is that fair? He's here. Chris, we can't hear you. Maybe he's taking a leak. That's my guess anyways. <laughs> uh oh, here we go. We're getting a visual. So that's a yeah, proxy. That's it. Wow. We still can't hear you, Chris. I'm not sure why. Hey, uh, setting or something. Oh, there you are. Yeah. I now heard him. There we go. Go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it depends on the car. It depends on the track. It depends on the motors, and heavily depends on tires. Um, mm -hmm. There is, and and I think Dennis and anybody who's been doing this a while will will suggest that if yeah. you see a picture with a car with a lot of weight on it, it really means nothing. Um, you have to put that in context of the car and the track and, and all the rest of the stuff. Um, that car that I just showed with all of that lead on it weighs 73 grams. The whole car, is, body and all? The whole car weighs 73 grams. That is not a heavy car. <laughs> what kind um, of body was it? Is, is it you know, some most, sort of special lightweight lead you put in? <laughs> well, it's just the lead. I mean, most of the most of the top cars in the GT3 proxy, which the top cars are very, very, very quick cars. Um, they're all up around the 90 gram range. So lead means um, what's an ideal weight for a car? Who knows? Um, it depends on so many factors. The 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 Obviously, the lighter the car, all things being equal, the better. It will accelerate a bit quicker, it'll break a little bit quicker, and a bunch of other things. But, um, you know, you have to look at everything and then decide on the, on the weight on the car. Um, you know, I'm, 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 Dennis, will, Dennis will agree with that 100%. There's no, you know, there, there's no number that says it's right. Um, no, but it's it's also quite easy to get too heavy. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. You know, but for... I think that I think that even more than even more than absolute weight, it's weight distribution that you have to worry about. Yeah, and certainly from a proxy perspective, when you're building a proxy car, the fallacy is that you have to build a really fast car. What you have to do is build a car that the worst driver in the field can actually get around the track without flipping off too much. Um, so the, the, the car that I pictured, I personally would not set up the car like that for myself. Um, I would definitely, um, set it up that way for a bunch of other drivers and the same with gearing and all the rest of the stuff. So removing some weight, uh, John Kitt, I saw you wanting to talk about something. What, what would you do? differently that you did before well, I, I was just going to say you, you, you talk about old bad habits you just like take it out of the and, and put it on the track and then wonder why it's not running really well oh that's and what that's happened. what your habit was was just popping yeah, the car down exactly. like, what's wrong with yeah exactly well, you know, and then you re realize that oh well you know maybe you have to do something to it <laughs> what gives <laughs> 
John, John my, my problem with the opposite, um, and I've been, I, I wrote something on Slot Racer uh, this morning where I reviewed the first 11 races I ever did at the first club I ever did five years ago. And really, I look back on it and I thought, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? And I've gone the opposite way to John. I had, instead of saying, I'll take this car and run it, I immediately took the car and thought, well, those gears aren't very good and that's not the maximum motor I can use. And, you know, and these tires aren't the right thing and these wheels could be improved and that, you know, that gear train could be better and I should put this and this and this. Most of the things I did, went backwards. They didn't improve the car. They made the car worse because I didn't have the experience, you know, of how to tune it. Um, when, when it was, uh, you were talking earlier about what things would you do? Um, I, cause I did this one recently. This is an old, old car. Let's get that right. It's an old spirit pug. Oh yeah. Uh, one of the things I did was dip it because it's got a hydrographic on it. Not particularly good because I'm not, you know, not that fussed about it, and I had only a rough piece of this left. Uh, but the first thing I do is decide which class I want to race in it. So the club I used to race this can't race them there anymore. We replaced that with slotted touring car uh, cars. Uh, and so, you know, if I pick up a car, the first thing I'm thinking, and in the refurb or refresh, is what am I going to do with this? So I set this car up with a deep guide, red tires. The idea is to take it to a wood track. So I've aimed it at a wood track. So, you know, before I even do anything else, but I do agree with, uh, I do agree that a complete strip down is, is required to do a refresh. Uh, but the first thing is to decide what you want to do with the car. Where are you going to race it? And quite often they're in a box because you can't race it in the place you used to race it. So that's why, you know, even if it was, even if it wasn't good, you still need to refresh everything and look at everything. And I did with this car. It was quite, it was quite an interesting, quite an interesting challenge. What kinds of things did you do to that car? Uh, well, the hydrographics. I took out the um, the Spirit Pug had quite a heavy glazing system, and you see this where the glazing is in one piece, the crystal work. So instead of lightweight pieces like an NSR, it's one great big slab like a scale electric. And uh, this one has quite a, a heavy roof bar to hold all the pieces, you know, the side windows, the rear window, the front, all into one piece. So I didn't, you know, that, that's bad because that's weight up top. That's high center of gravity nonsense. That's got to go. So Normally those one piece pieces. window sets, they're like about two mil thick as well. They're like really, really thick. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So that got done, the wheels got done. I looked at the gearing and I have no idea why I thought NSR gearing would fit a Spirit Peugeot car <laughs> and fit properly, because it doesn't. And I, when I remember I raced it, it was always noisy. And I did wonder why it wasn't, right? But they were sidewinder, NSR sidewinder gears in an angle winder car. And because they weren't the right size, the pinion was too far out. So you got that kind of angle to try and make it all mesh up and. It was, you know, it was awful. The um, the pod didn't move properly. So, you know, the, the Spirit was one of the first cars I saw with a proper pod under here. You can see that. So you've got, you know, you've got suspension movement. But, but Alan, isn't, that's, not, that's nothing a ball pin hammer can't fix, is it? <laughs> you, could, you could fix anything with a hammer, definitely. Um, but, you know, reviewing <laughs> fresh braids, you know, checking the axles, make sure they work, uh, pull the motor out, dip the motor, make sure it's working properly, um, and just check everything over to make sure it, you know, it's good. So sanding down the body to get rid of some weight and to get rid of the old paint job. And uh, hopefully it will be okay just for a muck about on a, a wood track. What we also those, Alan? Uh, those, oh, not seen those. These are something I picked up quite early maybe five years ago. These are Scale Auto Monzas. Ah, okay. Nice. And I like it. Uh, the, the reason they use them is a very small diameter, 14 ah. point something. Mm -hmm. They look really cool. They're almost like old school dish mags. They look a lot, they yeah. look a lot like those, uh, the wheels that we used to get from a guy in Denmark called Kai, years and years and years back before yeah. um, 
before uh, CV design and before um, Slotting Plus and, uh, and other people like that started making fancy wheels. Mm -hmm. There was a guy in Denmark who made them. I still have a set on one on a car somewhere, but they were very similar design to them. I think North Staffs are, are selling something similar at the moment. They do them in gold, red, blue. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen them on Facebook. They look quite nice. Actually, I think I've got a couple of sets in the other room. I'll grab some later. Martin, are they are they anodized aluminum? Is that how they get the color? Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'll go and grab some now. Go for it. Yeah, look, look forward to seeing that. Anybody I, else I, got anything they want to talk about? I, the, I, uh... I do actually. Okay. If, if, ahead, I, 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 I don't mean to take over things here but i just <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're never guys, gonna let it go john we're never gonna let it go <laughs> i know i know sorry it's that a type personality i feel like anyway. um but you guys always talk about weights and so forth and it got me sort of interested to just to see how those 356 bodies and what they weigh and so forth so and i know this is a wee bit old school so forgive me welcome back to chemistry class in grade 10 uh, but so I just took the body itself and it's got the, the dye in it. It's not painted. So, um, and put it on the old triple beam balance. Um, and it comes out to nine point set. Well, not, not, what is it? Nine point, uh, yeah, 9.85 grams. Wow. That's not bad. Now that's just, just the body on its own. Yeah. Which in itself isn't fair because it has parts to it. So I took the parts, including the inserts, which I don't think is fair, but they don't weigh much anyway and took a, took a wee bit of a, of a look at that weight, including like it's a full driver, full interior, all the other bits. Uh, and that alone comes up to um, 11.4 grams. So when you weigh the whole darn thing together, uh, there it is all together, it comes out to 21.1 uh, grams. Now you can lose a lot of the weight by shaving down the interior or you see the interior bar here for, for, for mounting. I made those really robust, so you can cut them in half to two thirds even to mount. So you could lose a lot of weight there and all the weight in the body is down low. So I was amazed at how, how light it is. Oh. I, I mean, that just goes to show the quality of your, of your poles. You know, you got nice thin walls on that body and yeah. Well, it and just it's shows small, you of course. And it's, and it's small, but, but it's, yeah, I, I know, I, Greg, I think you're right. I mean, even a blind squirrel finds a nut, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's not my quote, but I use it a lot, yeah. <laughs> but of course, we don't know whether that's actually legal because your, your, your triple beam balance is not legal. Not legal well, for some it, 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 it's, uh, Listen, that, that, my lawyer made me put that, that sticker right on here for these photos. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your lawyer being so, your, your daughter or your wife? <laughs> both, both. Both. Yeah, they, they said, we're not losing the house over a slot car body. <laughs> yeah, so, but I was amazed at just how light this, like, it's under 10 grams just for the body. And that's with the well really big mounts. Very well done. So I thought, that, I thought I'd share that with you. And, and that, that 21 is including the glass and it's, well, right. and, and again, I don't know if, and maybe, you know, Chris, Dennis, you'd be able to, I don't think resin has the density of plastic perhaps, but it's certainly, you know, the mass is certain, it seems to be less. I don't know, it's bizarre. It's small. Yeah, I guess yeah, you're it's right. The, it's the size more than size. anything else. Okay. Cool, but I thought I'd share that in case anybody wants to make a race car out of one of these things. It, it, it might be a half decent little, I'd make a nice little class, a 50s class. I mean, you could put, you could, if you, if you had a Ninko Classics class, you could probably allow the, what is it, TRS or TSR or something. There's an adjustable chassis that, that is often used for that class of car with an NC1 and basically have it compete in that same class. That would yeah. be perfect for that. Class. Actually, you know what, that, that's a really good point. I should weigh a Ninko and see what it weighs at. Yeah. That your car is smaller than the Ninko, right? It is. It's the proper scale. Yeah, it is. Hmm. Good stuff, Nick. You were showing off a you were showing off a car. Did you have some fancy wheels on there? Um, yeah, these are North Staff wheels. And how clear you can see those. So five five. They're, they're black anodized aluminium. Um, they weigh a bit next closer. To a bit closer. Yeah. No, yeah, you can't there really you see. It. There you go. That's nice. Mm -hmm. 
Those are nice. Yeah. They're they're really on par with NSR wheels. It doesn't matter what pattern you get the um, North Stash wheels in. They're on par with NSR alloys, yeah. slotted alloys. They're they're a really good product. They look almost identical to the CB design stuff that we get here mm -hmm. in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Nick, do they fit slotted axles or do they fit NSR axles? Um, so I've got so. these. I've got I've got these on an NSR axle. Okay, and they're not and they're not a little That's loose. Really. No, yeah, they're, they're, they're sold as three thirty second, um, Dennis. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, a three thirty there second axle. Yeah, there is. A, you, yeah, there is a, a, don't get Chris started. <laughs> And if Sorry. you take a regular NSR wheel and try to put it on a slotted axle, it doesn't fit. Yeah, it won't go. It won't go. Yeah, no. correct. The NSR axle is ever so slightly. It's like 0.1 or 0.2 of a mil smaller. Smaller than it. Yeah. Well, actually, what it is is that the slotted axle is that, that same amount bigger than everything else. Yeah. Because the NSR axles and the Thunder Slot and Slotting Plus and everybody else are all the same size as the commercial 332nd axles that we well, use in 124 scale because they all this, fit in those, inside those bearings. Yeah, they, well, mm. talking of bearings, this is interesting. The um, ball bearings, the, ball, the race bearings that slot it do, that fit in these new ops that they do, or they're the four-wheel drive bearings, whatever they're called, the slotted axle doesn't fit through them. Correct, because yeah, it's a regular- the NSR axle. Yep, it's a regular 332 bearing, and the yeah. slotted axles are that so I'll, I'll, thousandth or <laughs> two thousandths of an inch bigger. Yeah, I do think that's slightly naughty of NSR selling a bearing that their axle doesn't fit. Oh, slotted, not NSR. Sorry, uh, sorry yes. Yeah, it's the NSR axle that does fit them, yeah. Oh. Okay. The, the CB design wheels that we get here are all specifically made for the slotted axle, which is why I asked, because they, they can be a little loose. That looks good. Yeah. Uh, they, they can be a little loose on um, on an NSR axle. Yeah. I always watch that carefully when what I'm using where. In fact, I have two um, two uh, axles for my hoodie for my my tire truer. Mm -hmm. uh, one is their regular 332 axle. The other one is a slotted axle that I've taken and I've actually sleeved the section of the slotted axle that goes through the bearings and cut that to three millimeters right. so that I have the perfect fit of a slotted wheel on a slotted axle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anybody else want to circle back on the, what would you do differently many years later topic or? Is that, is that what it was? I was a little late, oh. so I didn't hear that when I came in. <laughs> That's basically what we were talking about when you came in, but you know, okay. that's evolved. You know, we can still talk about CBD wheels and yeah. <laughs> yeah. want to. I know what I would do. I wouldn't build as heavy as I used to when I'm the scratch building that I, when I first started scratch building again, when I came back into slot car racing, I still had the mindset of uh, powerful motors and foam tires. And so the first couple of cars that I built were horrible when I put them on silicone um, because uh, they were just way too heavy and they were way too heavy in the front of the car. It's, they just didn't work. In, so, so Dennis, when 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 you do, do you try to balance the weight or just make it as light as possible? How, how do you approach? Uh... Well, I you know it, it depends on as we said right from the beginning. It depends on tires because you can get away with heavier cars when you're using when you're using rubber tires, right? Uh, when you're using urethane or silicone, you need to make them lighter because you you don't want to overpower the traction of the tire. So, uh, you know, if I was building now for a, for a urethane proxy, I would be building as overall as light as I could. Um, if I was building for a rubber proxy, I'm going to build probably a little heavier. Uh, and then it depends on, on, after that, it depends on tuning. I'll try and build them to a roughly 60, 40 rear to front um, uh, weight distribution to start with. Um, because you want the you want the rear of the car heavier in order to promote some slide, uh, but uh, it would all depend then on tuning. Yep, you, I mean it's it's always a I mean always as a rule of thumb build your car as light as you can and do everything you need to do to it. Make sure everything's round and square and flat and true and all the rest of the stuff. When you put it on the track. 
once you've driven a few and know what you, the car will tell you very quickly what it wants um, in terms of weight. Um, you know, 60-40 is a great rule of thumb and what it works out to, but I wouldn't necessarily build a car with that uh, percentage in mind. It's going to end up being close, but again, it, it depends, you know, if you've got super grippy tires and a really high numeric ratio and a powerful motor, you're probably going to have to put some more weight towards the nose of the car, otherwise it's just going to lift the guide right out of the slot. So don't worry, don't have a number in mind, have a performance objective in mind, um, and then tune the car to what the car wants and, and the track, what the car wants, given the tires, given the track, given the voltage, given all the other variables that go in. Um, things will change dramatically, but don't get hung up on every car I build has to be 60-40. That, that, that's, that's, if I had done that back then, that would be one of the things that I would not do now because it's just not right. So Dennis, when you were, when you were doing those early scratch builds, having come back into the hobby, what when you say you made them too heavy, is it because you chose thicker materials, you added too much material, you were just making it super strong? Uh, a little bit of all of that, but mostly thicker material. Uh, back, in the, back in the day, we were, we, when we built brass chassis, uh, we used to use one millimeter brass, 40,000 brass. Um, that is not easily obtainable if you go into your local hobby store or to the local race shop and look in the KNS brass rack. So I started building everything with uh, 1 16th brass, 0 62, and that adds a lot of weight. Yeah. And then I started building, um, in fact, I'll go and, I'll go and fetch some uh, in a minute, but I started building uh, designs that I had used when I left slot car racing. Um, and it was, it, they just, they didn't translate from the old style of racing on wood tracks with glue, foam tires, uh, with wings on the bodies, uh, with high power motors, they, that style of car did, just did not translate into um, heavier, heavier body, silicone or rubber tires, uh, or, or urethane tires, plastic tracks, or wood tracks without glue, uh, low power motors, um, it, they just didn't work. So give me a chance and I'll go and fetch a couple of cars and we can talk about that a little more if you like. Absolutely. Yeah. Anthony's on board. <laughs> Should we choose a new topic while he's looking for that? Or does anybody else want to pitch in on that? Okay. Uh, this, is what I, this is what I used to race in the 80s. Let me... Oh, Paul, I love the box. Uh, that was specially built by um, an old cabinet maker, right? In the... mm -hmm. Oh, right. man, that's cool. What, what impresses me the most is you can pick it up with one hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because mine, you cannot. Exactly. It's a big lad, though, <laughs> Paul. <laughs> you got one of the big ones? or Because I because my small one... Mine's smaller than that, and I hesitate to pick it up with one hand. <laughs> yeah. We used to run it. You're talking about lead. I don't know if you, can... you put lead on a metal chassis. <laughs> yeah. That's a womp, right? No. no, no, no. That's, that's what my father built. Yeah. That was a 124. That's a, a 124. That's a 24 hour car. It actually won because the motor unscrewed they completely took the back end out re, re put it clipped the wires together and that was it nice. whereas all the others run soldering the motors and put them in but uh, you can see the thickness of the the brass yeah that's one sixteenth or so yeah, it's pretty thick uh, yeah. so uh, was your w w was your mom upset when your dad took the kick plate off the front door to make the car <coughs> Oh, she was upset when the chassis hit the radiator down the end of the room. And if it survived that, it was a good chassis. <laughs> yep. But yeah, that's that's um 
I think that's a no. I've got the fos, these are fossil bronze ones. That's probably uh 70 71 when he built that, eh? Yeah, uh, I've got loads of this. Well, yeah, I get. I guess the Cold War was still on, so you had to make sure it survived the blast. <laughs> hey, I, I think that's got. Yeah, it's got Group Twelve armature in that. Yeah. So, what's this one? Oh, this is the phosphorus bronze one. Doesn't look it, but it, it's that one is a. Again, yeah, oh. the lead, yeah, same basic design, yeah, yeah. That's the only way you could keep them on the track, <laughs> especially when they're going for a bank like that. Oh, that brings back memories. Oh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, we're but getting that, old. Uh, well, that one's even that was really early because it doesn't even have the drop axle that became so popular later in the UK. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking 70, 71. Yeah. I, I, I was racing these right to 80, 84, 85. Yeah. So I was running from 75 onwards. She can fast gears. Yeah. Well, yeah. well now we know why the, well, they were the best they were the best gears you could get. Fast gears, they were really good, yeah. Now we know why the MGB stayed in production for so long. It was the same thing with slot cars. Yeah. Uh -huh. Did you get your body, did you get your chassis there, Dennis? Yeah, I got it all. So the first thing I'm going to do is this. I'm just going to show you a picture first, or a couple of pictures. Can you see that? Yep. All oh. right. So those those are the kind of bodies that we were racing when I finished when I stopped racing. Uh, silhouettes of real cars. This one was supposed to be the front. The, the white one in front was supposed to be a, a 917 Porsche. The rear one was supposed to be a 312 Ferrari. Uh, both of them had extended noses, uh, um, flattened out of scale. And then we, we put these uh, wings on the side and big spoilers on the back. And then underneath them, we drove things like this. Right? And so this is the, probably one of the last cars that I built. Um, no, well, not quite, but it, it's towards the end of my first uh, career in stock car racing, which ended in 89. Um, and so this car had, you know, it had a steel uh, spring steel center section. It had this bloody great piece of 032, uh, of 330 seconds wire across the front. I called this the coat hanger um, design. It had these big pans under the wheels. It had very little weight at the back or in the middle of the car. So when I started, uh, when I started back, uh, into slot car racing now, uh, the very first car that I built was this one. Uh, can you see that? Yep. Yeah. Right. So this is this is on a true scale uh, products um, PETG 962 Porsche, but you can see what I was doing. Right. Lots and lots of weight up the front. Uh, <clears throat> all the the same, the same massive amounts of movement, right? And originally, this particular one, uh, these holes in the back of the pans here, and this hole just in front of the motor, uh, there were magnets in there. Um, and uh, if I ran this on a Carrera track at the time with the magnets in, it was, it, it was, it was a, it was a pretty much a rocket. But as soon as you take, go onto a wood track. Uh, it just didn't work. And even now with uh, with decent rubber tires on the back, it's still not a terribly good car. It never was a terribly good car. So very early on, I looked at this, I thought, man, maybe that's not the way. And so the second, or the, no, the, that was the first one that I built. That's serial number one. This is serial number three. Um, again, a, a, a PETG vac formed body from uh, TrueScale. This is the, the Courage uh, LMP car. And then when I did this one, I thought, you know what? I'm going to build a really, really light car because I'm running on because I'm running with a magnet on a Carrera track. So I built this car. Uh, I made it inline because it was about the only thing that would fit in the body. Um, 
and it got silicon tires from the beginning. These are indie grips that are on the back here. And I found out very quickly that this car actually ran really, really well on a non-magnet track as well. On my wood track, it's, a, it's still a very, very fast car. And it's purely because it's very light and it doesn't overpower the tires. No, so, Dennis, is that an S can motor? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a slotted one of the early slotted twenty nine K motors. Wow, the very early ones, the you know in two thousand six or whenever they were. When did and you? It, that's, when did you? That's a tune. When did you do the start on the tuning forks stuff? This one? Yeah. Oh, I mean, we we ran these we ran these tuning forks. Um, back in the in the late 70s and, yeah. and mid 80s right yeah. and so i just i just adapted that design from then okay plus i was looking at all sorts of other things by then and you know it, you could see them elsewhere yeah. um and then when i started building uh proxy cars this was one of the first proxy cars that i built that's under a, a styrene uh, better better bodies um 91730 um that I built. And this one still had like the one that Paul was showing all those fancy movements, right? This was what they called a flexi ISO in those days with the center hinge that way and the hinge this way, and then still the hinges on the bodies, uh, you know, the hinges on the side pans. Uh, but this is all built out of, uh, I think it's uh, 0.032 brass, you know, 0.8 millimeter brass. And so it's, it's significantly lighter. And uh, on foam tires, this car actually runs really, really well. And on my home track on silicon tires, which is what I've got on it now, it runs great, right? So I started learning very quickly that, that weight was the way to go or lack of weight. Um, then when we started, this car was my Can-Am car from a year back or so. And I, tr I chose one of those 25,000 RPM Fini, uh, uh, piranha motors with the fancy magnets. And I thought, well, I need to get something that's a little heavier to control that. Big mistake. As soon as you go heavier, the, you, you start overpowering the tires and just didn't, it just didn't, it didn't work as well as I had hoped. Um, it's a horrible bloody motor too, Dennis. Yeah, that, 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 that's true. Then, then for the GT3 proxy, I did a, a, this is a Black Arrow um, Ferrari uh, 458 Italia body. Uh, and then I started building them much lighter, but still with all those same movements, uh, flex down the middle and, uh, and movements back and forward and hinged pans and all kinds of crap. Uh, you don't need it, right? If that's still not, too yeah, much if that, movement. If that really moves a lot. Yep. Yeah. And then this year, uh, this year's GT3, I, I, I went even lighter. I tried this one. And this has almost no movement, just a little yeah. bit of movement up and down, <clears throat> flex movement here, nothing else. You can see, uh, maybe you can see them. There are two stoppers. Yeah, you can see that just in here, uh, there's, or, or in here, there are these little stoppers that, that control the, the movement of the pan. And they've actually got pieces of um, pieces of uh, um, lead wire insulation over the wire, so that it's almost there's almost no actual movement. It's just dampened movement there, right. and the rest is all just sprung. And once I got the front tire sorted out, this car actually runs pretty well. But mm -hmm. I used too thick of a I used too thick of a um, of a rail. These are 062 rails, and so it doesn't quite generate the grip I would like it to. Anyway, so that's that lot. So there's a, oh sorry, that that's just a uh, like a uh, ten thousand foot view from two thousand four to two thousand twenty one. That's the last car I raced. Ah, Superbird. Yeah, and look at look how the change went. No weight. Yep. Like you got the flexi ISO. Yep. And the big long. Yep. And I put that on the back because I kept getting shunted up the arse. It broke the back axles. And there's yeah. three second drill yeah. blanks. Yeah. yeah. Or 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 if you hit the gear, um, yeah. if you if you you know, we were the way that those those gears, not so much the fast gears, but the mutleys and the and the um 
and uh, what were the other ones? The, there were Muttleys and there was something else that came after the fast gears and they would change the, they would do like, um, like uh, slot it and others do nowadays, have a single diameter for all the spur gears and then change the shape of the teeth. So if you were using a 36 tooth size, but you were running a 38 tooth gear, the teeth themselves were very, very small. And if you got a shunt up the back, the chances were good that you, that you damaged the gear. So we always had a gear guard of some sort around the back or mm -hmm. something like that, like Paul showing there to stop the body getting sucked in. Now, now Paul, was, that, was that on a wood track, Paul? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That, wood track with glue. That was, that, that was the straight up that they used to go down on was 100 foot long. It went into it, it, it come down a hill into a big bank and it went straight down and you had a hairpin at the end of the straight. And you just lined the goop up just before that hairpin. And that's the only braking assistance you had on that hairpin. We're but actually allowed to apply traction compound. Up to the track in those days yeah we used to run those mm -hmm. 124s that you were showing with the air dams and we used to call them pooper scoopers because the the fit the fins used to go like that oh yeah that straight yeah where was that paul that was reeds uh, i don't know that one uh, those, those, those wings used to make a hell of a noise too when they just yeah. go down the track they're just flapping around but that's that was a that's a group. I was trying to show you that's a that's another group twelve in that. Yeah. But I took that down um, North Devon, and it went like stink. Well, they couldn't believe what it was running. But I had to change the wheels because it's sponges on it. But that was the last car I ever bought, and that was about 80, 83, I think that was. Good times. And that body was illegal. ECRA made that body illegal. <laughs> Why? Because, it, again, it was called the pooper scooper. <laughs> because then it come out in front of it, you just, they just, you just went straight under them. You could what get used them so to, low what, yeah. that... What used, to happen in, what used to happen in the ECRA uh, rules in the old days is that uh, the chassis had to be very very close in wheelbase to yeah. the body that you were using and you'll see even now if you look at beta bodies uh, particularly the vacuum formed ones the wheelbase is actually engraved into one of the little into yeah. one of the wheel arches where you cut it out because the, the the chassis had to match the wheelbase of the car so we started uh, or the british guys started using all kinds of crazy cars because they had very long wheelbases particularly in the, their saloon car class right and, That's a ten and, and after a while, they said, OK, uh, we're tired of everybody racing Bentleys or uh, whatever. So they brought in another rule that said that the cars could the, the bodies could be of cars that were no more than was it five years or seven years old. And so after a while, some of these bodies actually uh, um, just uh, were had to be retired because the full size cars were no longer racing. <laughs> lame <laughs> yeah pretty we thought it was lame my friend russell used to run the open version of that superbird uh there was a there was a plymouth superbird but a, a, a roadster version and he used to use that and i'll see if i can dig up the photos i've got some somewhere he used to use that in our in our open sports car class because it was so big and uh, it was so long and you could get these long side dams down the side and this enormous wing up the back and Paul, none of that stuff that I showed was 124. That was all 132. 132. Yeah, we ran 132 scale wing cars we, in we, South Africa. Because Reed, Reeds was an eight lane track and it was so big, you could run 124 <clears throat> and 132. So yeah. it'd be like one club night would be all 132. Then you'd have the 124s. And on 124 night, on the practice night, used to go in and look at where the bank was at the end of the track, or at the beginning of the straight. We used to look at the ceiling because as they come down off the hop and go into that bank, if you got it wrong, you went up, hit the ceiling and into the trophy cabinet. And they'd always put divots in the roof. So you'd always look to see if there's any new marks in the ceiling before you stepped in the door. <laughs> that one's mine. That one's mine. That one's mine. Yeah. That one's mine. Oh, I'll put a few in there. I'll tell you that now. 
I, now, Paul, did anyone try to do like a 59 Cadillac body just to really take it to the max or no? No. <laughs> Speaking of crazy plastic car that. bodies, I'm ready to segue into a, a, a quick show and tell. Uh, last week, I talked a little bit about a, a print I did for a guy uh, that was breaking too easily. He, he received them, but unfortunately, they were a little bit too much undersized. Uh, and so I played around a little bit more with the model in, in the printer area and by tilting it up even more, like before I had it like 45 degrees or something like that in order to fit more model into the printing space. This time it's like 65 degrees or something like that. Basically I found as much of a tilt as I could get to make the car as long as possible within the height and width and, and everything of the printing volume. Unfortunately, I do not have a banana for scale on this particular picture, uh, but here is a picture of the freshly printed Chrysler 300 model. Uh, and that is about six and a quarter inches in length. Uh, and if you tilt your head sideways, you can see, in fact, let me see if I can do another picture here. Yeah, so that's standing, that's how it, Basically, upside down of that is how it came out of the printer. So yeah, that's nice. Isn't there a farm in Texas with a whole bunch of cars that look exactly like that in the ground? Yeah, that's, the ground. <laughs> that's Cadillac. I know which one you're talking about. Uh, it's, it's called Cadillac Ranch. Right. Oh, Cadillac Ranch. Okay. Yeah. So. Oh, it looks nice and smooth, bro. It did come out nicely. I didn't use. I didn't do anything fancy. I basically just said, told the software how much of an angle I wanted it, scaled it up to fit <laughs> as much as I could, uh, and then just had it automatically do supports. As you see, I have, it is currently in that uh, condition. I'm not planning to remove any support. <laughs> I think I'm just gonna send the whole thing to him with all the supports on there. And let him do the cleanup. Now, uh, Greg, is, is, that, is that resin? Sorry. Yeah, that's from my resin printer. Oh, yeah. So that looks really, really good. Yeah, and that's not even at the highest resolution, the resin printer. Code. That was basically at the lowest printing resolution. I'll, let me share that again. I'll zoom in a little bit. That's not a very good picture. But yeah, th I mean, that's the, that's the main benefit to a resin printer is that you, you can still see layer lines. Like if you look here on the B pillar, it's kind of a weird shape. I don't think that's in the actual car. So that's probably a, a printing artifact from when this wall was kind of wanting to bend inward during the printing process. Uh, and then it got hooked up by this over here and stuff. But yeah, you know, that's well, something that shouldn't be hard to smooth out. Well, the other advantage, if you send him all those supports, he could make some really, really good scaffolding for his track. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> He'll, he will have all the supports. He can, he can make a junkyard. <laughs> <laughs> a, a metal recycling yard with all the scaffolding. <laughs> oh yeah, we had a bunch of bands that stopped touring, so we just threw their their rigs into the junkyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, and then then put a worn out Spinal Tap sign on top of it. There you go. <laughs> These go to eleven. <laughs> all right. So in the seventies. Yeah. Does anybody have anything they want to ask about, show, and tell about? Otherwise, I have a, I've go got ahead. a very quick one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this is a very much a work in progress, so don't get too uh, critical on this. Um, Chris, why don't you have your camera on? Because my camera's broken. Um, and I, I will, I promise I will get it fixed. <laughs> is this up? He's been yep. promising yes. that since yep. issue number one. See anything to get critical about there. Uh, yeah, terrible, terrible. I can't believe you're showing <laughs> that to us. Um, this Someone asked me to, to do an NSR in the um, Rosberg's Portugal 1986 colors. Yeah, what, wasn't that his practice car, Chris? Yes. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, that was for the light packages, and then, and then it went back to the other, right? Yeah. Um, so I decided to make a few changes. The, all of the NSRs have open radiators on the side panels here, and that's not what this, the, the MP4 had. So 
I filled these all in. Um, I created some vents back here. They're not perfectly to scale, but they look a lot better than uh, the NSR thing. And the side scoops here, I filled up the holes and did a few things there. So very much a work in progress. All the insides of the wing plates still have to be painted black. I've got to make some mirrors and stuff like that. And then I'll do one of my, if I can find the driver, um, which is kind of cool. That looks nice. Nice. Oh, that's nice. That's very nice. nice. Very nice. Yes. It's yeah, like well, one of the Interlagos helmets. Use for the seat belts that's first. Incredible. Sorry. The seat belts are done. Um, I went into like a like a camping store or something like that, and um, you can buy um, adhesive back nylon for repairing tents and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it, it has that sort of webbing look to it, and you just cut it yeah. and stick it on. And I also use the same a variation of the same stuff for if I'm ever doing uh, visor bands for around helmets, because if you try and paint, if I try and paint seat belts or goggle straps, it I just drive myself insane. So. It's yeah. easy just to cut a little thin strip. It's got nice, clean, sharp edges, and it actually looks cool as well. So um, a long way to go on this, but and you can't. this is a bad picture. I, I put some gauges on the dashboard for him and a few other little things. So yeah. Um, helmet, what are you doing chassis-wise? Sorry? The chassis? Uh, chassis is, and then it's, it's going to run in an NSR class. So I have one of the harder chassis. I built a few little braces for it. Um, that's in progress. I will ditch the, uh, great big FK 180 motor and put a motor in. So the car will actually handle and we'll be off to the races. They mm -hmm. do handle very well when they put, when you put a 130 in them. Oh yeah. Much better. Yeah, I changed mine to a 25k NSR. It's wonderful. Yep. We're going to talk about that helmet. Uh, yes, this is, as Dennis said, um, I wish I could tell you I painted, actually, I wish I could tell you I painted this. I did not. I bought it. Um, um, uh, Interlagos Miniatures makes 30 or 40 different drivers from, you know, different, mainly that sort of era. And when it's blown up this size under the macro lens, you can see little problems with it. But if you figure it's about, a, you know, it's, it's probably like a quarter of this size in real life. So when you look at it, you know, with your naked eye, they, they look gorgeous. They're just, and they make such a difference to the car. No, it look, that looks really, really good. Yeah. They're, they're yeah, not, excellent. but, you know, that's... It is what it is. And all the little decals here, I did not make any of the driver's suit decals. These are just off of an old, a uh, few years ago somewhere, I got some HO scaled, HO sized uh, Marlboro decals from somebody online. So these are just a few little of those HO decals just stuck onto the side of his driver's suit. So anyway, that's it. I'm done. Awesome. Looks beautiful. Thank oh, you. Looks good. I don't know if you can see this. That was the last rendition of the Reed's track. And if you look carefully in the background, you can see the, the bank curve up the back there. That's uh -huh. Dave in front. But that's when it was altered, chopped, and redone. Not to country. Is that and how is that the original? No, that was the um, that was the final one before my dad went in there and ripped it all out and put a, a railway layer in there. No, but that's the original Reed's track, right? No, that, that's the last version of it. That's about 80, 87, 88. Well, did they, did they chop a few lanes? Because that's a five lane track. Yeah, no, it was completely re, that was the last, the, la, the eight lane was uh, scenic fied. Okay. And that was the last version of it. 
Interesting. Oh, name names and shame. Uh, obviously, Phil Collins in the front left there. Who's the rest of them? That's Dave Harvey. That's Tony Mills. That's Jeffrey Robbins. Dave Par uh, Dave Palmer. I am actually just coming in through the back door by the paint at the back there. I can't remember who's on the driver's rostrum. I knew that was you. Yeah, Harvey doesn't look like that anymore, that's for sure. No, that, that's not even there. That's, that's a housing estate now. So, so where was that, Paul? Where was Reed's? Reed's was Alsford Paper Mills. It was a big paper mills in Alsford. And the Reed's itself had um, a model engineering section which covered boats, aircraft, slot cars, um, round the pole stuff. So it had the cars all around the pole, aircraft around the poles. And in Moat Park in Maystone, it has a massive big uh, live steam uh, track that goes all the way around Moat Park. And that's the seven inch and five inch gauge, I think it is. And that was all sponsor it even had a fishing it had a sports side which had all the cob football rugby it was all to do with the people that worked at reeds fantastic and it i mean say so that we used to go there for parties at christmas and that they were brilliant what they used to put on love history is yeah. anybody ready for a giveaway now nah, we can wait. Yeah. <laughs> now let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to share my screen. This is, of course, for the Revo slot Ferrari F40. Oh, I forgot about that. There were 25 comments with the keyword of rip uh, up until 10 o'clock this morning or you know, an hour before the chat started. Uh, and as you can see, they're all in there. If you entered, make sure your name is in the list. I've already randomized it a few times. I did not count how many times I've randomized it. Paul, are you not in there? Number nine yeah. is me. Did you That's get you. that? Yeah, did you get the little trees a hint at the end of the comment? I'm sure I did, but I don't remember it now because there are so many comments. <laughs> <laughs> I, I put my comment hey, on bet, bet John... Kits molds. I've got more grit oh. than after Wayne's cleaned the track. Yeah. With cleaning products. Everybody was everybody played along really well. There wasn't a single person who did not contextualize the keyword into their comment. Some of them were a little bit more obvious than others. Some of them were especially clever. One guy did it as an acronym. Uh, so if you if you read his comment initially, it took me a few seconds to realize that he had used a, he made an acronym out of the <laughs> out of the keyword, but he he's in here too. So with one where's more, Graham? Uh, where's Graham? Uh, Graham Dodsworth was what the hell? What the hell? Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> you didn't use the proper, proper word. <laughs> <laughs> I I just put it in big letters, I think. Hold on, let me go to my videos. Doesn't matter, I can win the next one. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm curious. Comments. Oh, I turned comments off. Gosh darn it. I'd swear you were in there. Maybe it didn't get copied from my... Maybe I won and that was a list of losers. <laughs> you can, you can, you can, you can, not, not losers. Oh, it's your birthday. You commented pretty early on, right, Wayne? Right? Uh, yeah, sorry. Graham, yeah, Graham. I think it was pretty early. When it just G R I P in capitals, no, maybe it was a yeah. week early. <laughs> I'm not gonna let this one slide, so I'm gonna. No, I saw I saw Graham's comment for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, that's why I'm surprised it's not in the list. Here. Oh, it didn't delete the comments, did it? That would be really stupid. 
I just I just ran out for a couple of minutes. Did we announce a winner? It was did you announce a winner or no? No, we're we're okay. making because because I, I showed everybody the list and Graham saw that he's his name wasn't in the list. Okay. And I had to turn comments back on to to see the comments. Uh, okay. <laughs> now let's let's go back to. Right, while we're looking, why have you got the video of Tori Toff playing the ukulele in your favorites list? Do I? Yeah, it just came up then when you should, when you went to YouTube. Because anytime you click the like button, you, it show it just goes into that list. And I click yeah, like on funny. videos just because people say click the like button. And if I liked it, it was probably she was probably playing a good tune. It was very funny. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Graham, uh, Graham, Graham did, did your check clear, Graham? I guess not, eh? <laughs> I sent it in pennies and we don't have those anymore. <laughs> okay. Publish. Last night I sent it in shillings. We never had that for a while. Okay, so these should be sorted. And I, I just saw it. There we go. I want to make sure that they're not hard to find. So you, you commented fairly early on. It's mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I was second. Yeah, so you'd be near the bottom then. There he is, Graham Dodsworth. There he is. What the hell? Hmm. Well, wow. here come the conspiracy. You were literally the first commenter. Okay, so your your name's going to get put into the randomizer list here. Is that easy, Dad? Uh, yeah, uh, it's on next month's. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine by me. Yeah, it's easily done. It's always the wins. Now it's a fix. I just need <laughs> if he wins, it's definitely a fix. <laughs> hey, Graham, it's always the Canadians who get left out, eh? Oh uh, well, whatever. You know, we're just out here having fun. I'll, I'll have to apologize for not being on the list. <laughs> okay, there you are on the list. Should that looks like a winner right there. Okay, so uh, Thank you. I'm going to stop the share, and I'm going to re-randomize randomly, and then we'll do a, a final randomizing poll. And let's not forget, Paul, it's your birthday, isn't it? Yeah. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday. Okay. Hope you win, Paul. Okay, so I'm going to make sure Paul is on the top of the list so that he definitely... Birthday, Paul. <laughs> 30, Cheers, Paul. 30, Happy 30's, birthday. 30's a, 30's a tough one, buddy. I oh, know. I just I had to figure out how old I was. I'm not the saying, but... Dog years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> now we're to 26, and it has been randomized multiple times. The next time I click again... The person in spot number one, sorry, Leo, probably not going to be you, <laughs> is going to be the winner. Kyle Daly. Daly. Whoa, that was quick. So even better, it's not somebody who's on the chat. I kind of like that, not to diss you guys, but Kyle Daly, you need to contact me. I will send a comment to you. Uh, you are the wiener, and we will get you a Revo slot Ferrari F40. Come on, Kyle. Look list. Now, now here's what I, here's. I think I'll wait a little while to see, see how, see how quickly he contacts me. So, Kyle, if you're watching this video, whether you're watching it live and I don't see your name in the list or whatever, but watching it, you know, five minutes after I post the video, email me at ggaub at ggaub.com. That's g g a u b at g g a u b dot com, and and you know, put a subject of you know zoom chat winner or something like that and uh, i will contact you if he does not contact me within I'll put the first days, second. <laughs> if kyle does not contact me within the first couple of days i will contact i will make attempts to contact him through the comment on the video so we'll we'll, we'll give it until next week for me and kyle to touch bases if i'm unable to communicate with kyle we'll pull another name next know. week <laughs> Leo, you private were so message, close. Paul. Private message. But, but Leo was so close, he came in second again. Okay. Yeah, robbed, robbed. <laughs> yep. yeah. Kyle, if you're reading this and it's 2022, it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kyle, if it's next week, if it's if it's May instead of April, sorry, buddy, you missed out. <laughs> All right, that taken care of. Does anybody Thanks. else have anything? 
they wanted to ask or talk about. Martin, what you got? A few weeks back, um, Chris was discussing the, the do's and don'ts about um, breaking in motors. Could, could we just have a quick recap on that, Chris? Because that was very good, but I was drunk at the time and I didn't write the notes very well. <laughs> what, was your, what was your, sure, what was your question? Well, we were discussing, uh, you know, people saying I'm going to run it at three volts for six hours and then five volts for two hours and, you know, and then I'm going to dip it in methanol and then I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. He said the best way to run a motor in is, and he came up with a very succinct description of how, how to run a motor in. Okay. Um, the purpose of running in a motor is basically to get the carbon brushes, the motor brushes, to conform uh, to the diameter of the con. Um, the greater contact area, the smoother contact area will reduce arcing, which is a very good thing. That tends to pit the con. And it will also give you a little more, a little more motor performance, a little more torque. It's not going to make it rev any quicker. Um, it can also break in or wear in um, bushings that aren't perfectly aligned in the can. But what you should do, if you can, if you do buy motors at a shop and you can actually touch the motor, um, they're in little bags. If you can grab a couple and hold on to the can and then with your fingers, push the motor shaft back and forth a little bit. If it goes back and forth nice and smoothly and continually returns to the same place, you can sort of be assured that the motor bushings are fairly well aligned and the motor shaft is fairly straight. So in terms of breaking it in, um, all of the three volts, nine volts, 12 volts, 15 volts, whale oil, lemon juice, peanut butter, all the rest of the stuff is garbage. Um, what you're trying to do is get the motor brush to conform to the comm without introducing any arcing, which is going to pit the comm. So in a perfect world, if you could hook up, uh, um, a, I, I used to use Dremel shafts and just click them on and put them onto the end of the uh, motor and just spin the motor without any electricity. So mechanically just spin it. Um, that will make the brush conform uh, to the comm. If you are going to do it with electricity, which is like 99.9% .9 of the world does and is perfectly good, just do it at the slowest RPM you can, just so the motor is turning over. Um, if you look in and you do it at three and six volts, you'll see arcing between the brush. You don't, you don't, that's exactly what you don't want to see. Um, so you can put uh, the motor in a glass of water, which will tend to lubricate that whole um, system and run it at two or three volts. The, the brushes in all the little electric motors that we use today, S cans, FK180s, and all the rest of the stuff are hard like rocks. So you can, you can run those motors for half an hour at, at a couple of volts underwater, no issues whatsoever. Take the motor out, use a hair dryer or compressed air blower or whatever you've got to um, dry the motor out. Put a little tiny, tiny, tiny drop of oil onto both motor shafts and you're done. That's as good as you're going to get. Um, if you periodically want to clean the motor, again, you can um, use some contact cleaner. Um, low voltage and squirt it in through the holes in the can to the comm. That's the only thing you're worried about getting clean. And it's really the, the segments between the comm plates that you want to clean out and just clean out the junk. That works well as well. Um, there is no mumbo jumbo. There is no special fluids. There is no any of the rest of the stuff. Um, to, to, run a, to run a motor at full RPMs without any load is not a real smart idea. Um, they can throw wines and they can do a lot of bad things. So, um, you know, 15 minutes at two, or, you know, two volts, three and a half hours, at, don't, don't 
listen to any of that junk. Just that's not what you're trying to do. That's brilliant. Thanks, Chris. I'm sober and I can read those notes. So I can get drunk now. <laughs> All right. Yes. No, that, that really helps, Chris. Thanks, buddy. That don't mean you can run it in gin, Martin. I say. <laughs> <laughs> But don't try to tell some of the people online because they're like, they'll be like, well, it worked for me. Like, well, yeah, it worked. Yeah. But you didn't need Those it. Those wires are too thick. Those wires are too thick. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and at the end of the day, Martin, if you don't have a good motor, you don't have a good Like you're not going to, I mean, when, when you, if, if you, if and when um, folks order, um, quantities of motors from Mabuchi and Suntech and all the rest of the guys. They say on their website, and they let you know very, very clearly, there's somewhere between a 10 to a 15% plus and minus on your motor. So in the worst case scenario, you know, minus 15% plus 50, you could have a 30% change in, in motor RPM. So you can run that crummy motor in from now until you know, 2025, and it's not going to get to where it should be. So um, they will help you get to the sweet spot of the running it in will help you get to the sweet spot a little bit quicker. Um, it's not going to make it go any faster than the theoretical design behind the motor. So you know, magnet strength, the type of calm, brush tension, the number of the number of turns and the thickness of the wire completely dictate the maximum of that motor. Um, then from there, misaligned bushings and a less than perfectly straight motor shaft, everything just detracts from the theoretical maximum of the thing. So, you know, I'm, I, I, if, if you did not run your motor in and you were racing at a serious club level, I wouldn't, I don't really think that's a huge negative. Um, I've taken tons of motors out of the box, out of the package and stick them in the car and run them around. The one, the one thing that we've done for years, um, if you do that route, um, and if you, depending on how your controller is hooked up, um, a lot of the North American stuff we use like alligator or three prong, three individual connectors. Um, disconnecting your brake wire and running the car for a few laps, take it easy without the brake wire also helps in, in, in a few other little things. But Again, if you're if you're if your car is not set up well, if you got the wrong tires, another two or three hundred RPMs on your motor is going to make bugger all the difference. Huh. Here's one for you, Martin. Back in the day, our friend at La Maestra Light and Magic used to work in a hobby shop, and he he openly says he used to get the motors out of a packet, and he'd run like. 15, 20 of them and pick the best of the bunch right. for himself and then put the rest on sale. Yeah. When I was, um, I, um, years ago, I was sponsored by um, a company called P Potential Kinetics. There's a guy in Toronto who uh, Dan Miller and Dan, Dan Camilleri makes some of the best uh, high-end open armatures in the world and he's got tons of world championships and all the rest of the stuff so all of the armatures are made in his factory and because I was one of the factory guys you could buy the potential kinetic armatures but you weren't getting the ones that I was getting I was getting all the hand-picked ones coming off the assembly line and and yours were good they were great armatures but they were not the ones I had in my car it's not what you know, it's who you know. Well, and, and Dennis races, um, uh, we don't do it in Toronto, but but Dennis's guys run a lot of retro racing and they use uh, sealed can Falcons and JK motors. Um, and lots of guys will buy 20 and 30 and 40 of those at a time and then end up with three and just the rest become fishing lure weights or something like that. So. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, really nutty, uh, crazy uh, thing. And 
unfortunate. It's unfortunate because it's not good for retro racing in the long run. Uh, and it's caused by the fact that the tracks are too fast for the cars. So that people are looking through all these motors to get, uh, to find one or two that are uh, an absolute, you know, that are the, the rockets of the pack. But um, I know of guys who buy, who might buy 20 motors and then, and go through them all and they break them in and then check them and they'll go through them all and then go buy another 20 because not one of them is good <laughs> of the 20 is what they think is good enough. Right. But, um, you know, you're looking at, you're looking at such small differences in speed from one guy to the next that if you can find, you know, half a tenth of a second gap, uh, in qualifying, uh, it's going to change your the, the, the you know the, the change your ranking for the day by ten or twenty positions. Mm. And you know, I, we had a race this weekend. Uh, there were seventeen of us. Uh, the top guys, the top guys qualified at around three point, I think three point seven second laps. Um, I qualified at. I qualified at uh, around, I guess, uh, I qualified at 4002 and I was 16th fastest, right? So 0.4 of a second covered the whole field. Yeah. If, you know, if you ran a three, if you ran a 3.9 second lap, whether you were 0.98 or a 3.3, uh, changed your position by 10 or 20. Um, wow, Dad. I thought for sure that would wake Steve up, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. He didn't win, so. <laughs> uh, and I was and I was looking at other things while I was talking. So Greg switched my video off. So, I turned that's your fine. video. I turned your video off because your bandwidth is low enough that it was causing problems for us hearing. Oh, you. that's uh, weird. All right, thank you. I didn't realize it. It certainly. I I didn't see anything here that told me that. It looked. But it thank does you. Does look better now, no? Yeah, it does. <laughs> I, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. I got, I got a great gonna, face for radio. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead. Just look like I'm gonna stop Steve's video too. I don't think we need to watch yeah. this. Poor old Steve. <laughs> that is. Yes, yeah, sir. One on on motors is that um, in the kind of racing that Dennis does, like a like a foot on the straightaway, you're basically flat out ninety percent of the lap. Mm -hmm. So um, and running with sponge tires and a little bit of sp like the cars handle so well that eight inches a lap is really critical and, and you're completely flat out. Um, yeah. For, for 90% yeah, the of the problem, guys but... on this chat line running on a mixture of club tracks, home tracks, wood, plastic, um, the difference in a couple of hundred RPM in the motor, you're not going to notice that in a billion years. True. And I mean, a lot of this, this whole deal about running, breaking in motors underwater or in isopropyl alcohol or whatever, 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 came from days uh, of electric RC and carried over into slot cars where you were issued a motor on the morning of the race, right? So you had no time to prepare or to break in using any other uh, process other than something that broke the motor in as quick as possible. So the reason that they started breaking them in underwater is because you want to get the motor or you want to get the brushes bedded as quick as possible. And to bed them as quick as possible, you need to draw the maximum current through the brush at the time. And to draw maximum current out of the motor, you need some resistance on the motor. So you put them in water and it does two three things. It provides the resistance so that the motor draws a lot of current. Two, it keeps it cool so that the commutator itself stays cool and does not start deforming under the heat that's involved. And number three, it helps to flush away the, the, the dust from the brushes. So those are the three reasons that they, that they do that. Um, and in slot car racing now, in, in retro racing, when there are handout motors, we still do that because we get the motor on the morning of the race and you, you get maybe three motors. You could buy three motors. So you want to get them broken in as quick as possible so that you can find out which one is any good, whether you need to go get another one or not. And, uh, but if you don't have that problem, then 
running them in dry under under low RPM, low voltage, low current draw uh, conditions is, is always better. Okay, so on the on the high end disposal on the high end motors that that all come apart, um, you know, all the comms are diamond trued, and then there's a little gizmo put in between on the the the, the little tubes, the, the hoods that align the brushes. Those are all perfectly aligned. There's little tools like little burrs that will conform the face of the brush and they come in different diameters to the, the size of the diameter. So, but all of these things involve time to do that. So the underwater break-in thing, as Dennis said, eliminates, I have no time and what can I do in 20 minutes before the race starts kind of thing, so. Good stuff. What were you, Paul, did you have something you wanted to ask or say? Dennis, back in the day, we used to um, balance all our armatures on the old two razor blades. Did you do that as well? Yeah, I, I did that back in the day. Yeah. Sure. I mean, say so we we ne I never, but when I was racing, in, I never ever ran it. I mean, say so the group we had group twenties, the group twelves, and the sixteen Ds, but we never run. I never break broke anything in. I just got it. Well, my cars, I was lucky because my cars were built by Ralph Thomas. Uh, and, um, okay. he, he, everything was all done. I just picked the car up and went, right, there you go. What's wrong yeah. with it? Can't handle. He said, it's you, driver. Uh, <laughs> uh, we used to, when I was building, when I was building Group 20s and, uh, and Eurosport motors and things like that, uh, I'd break those in for sure, even after what Chris was talking about of aligning the brushes and, and cutting the commutator and so on. <clears throat> I'll still run them in at, at low RPM just to get I know them done. Ralph, I know Ralph did do the comms because he yeah. had a special little tool that was just gently went through the comm. And yeah. that was after he balanced it, though. Yeah, yeah you balanced the, the armatures were balanced. Uh, nowadays, armatures are all balanced on dynamic balancing machines mm -hmm. and have been for many years. Mm -hmm. um, and then the commutators are cut using diamond a diamond uh, tip tool in a, in a special commutator lathe. Um, you, the, the little diamond burrs that Chris was talking about that, that face the brushes themselves do two things. They, they, they get the, the diameter of the, of the brush close to the diameter of the commutator. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. And secondly, they rough up that surface. So you get rid of the skin on the, on the, on the brush and that helps, them, helps break them in quicker as well um and uh, but you still need a little bit of time to get the best possible fit between the brush and the commutator surface uh you've got to be careful and you know once the commutators get too small with regard to the size of the brush and that doesn't happen in in our 132nd scale motors but in a 124th scale motor it can happen uh is that the brush starts overlapping too much when it's when it conforms completely to the diameter of the of the commutator then the edges are starting to cover a whole segment of the com and actually start shorting to the next segment and if that happens you can get you can get a significant degradation in the speed of the of the of the motor so what you then do is actually just chamfer the edge of the brush or flatten the edge of the brush off so that you have a slightly smaller contact area on the commutator and it's not shorting from one, um, not shorting as much from one uh, commutator segment to the next. That, that's a long way from using a Pitman electric train motor, isn't it? It's come a long way. I mean, it, it, yeah. you know, I think slot car racing has pushed the design of permanent magnet, uh, high performance permanent magnet DC motors further than just about any other uh, technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know that anybody else has ever um, pushed a, pushed a motor uh, technology as far uh, as slot car racing has. I mean, so we, we, we used to have the pinions actually inside the yeah. end bell with the comm. So you had the comm and the pinion was there and it ran. Yeah, or inside at the end of the can, the other end. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Just, just for... Yeah, just physical dimensions to run sidewinders and angle winders in the 30-second scale cars, you needed that. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah. Did you tell it's, the uh, co-hanger why? It's not a, it's not, it, you know, if you, if you add it all up eventually, uh, there's no real difference. Um, there, are, there are one or two advantages to putting the pinion on the inside of the motor. And one of them is that you could balance the armature with the pinion already on. Right. Uh, and uh, I'm surprised that, that the wing car guys don't try that. I think that the reason for it is that it makes the can a little bit longer and therefore a little heavier, and they probably don't want to bother with that. Right. Um, we, use, we use Brute 20s. Group 20 can was what we use. We just cut it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I've done them. I've yeah. done them did, like that. Did you do the uh, coat hanger wide? Do you remember the metal coat hangers? Yes. Did you try that around the arms? I remember seeing in, in one of the model cars magazines from the UK way back, uh, uh, there was a Sweden rotor, uh, a couple of little um, handbooks that were added as a, as a, as a, an extra, um, you know, a, a handout with the magazine over a couple of months. And I remember seeing a photograph of him winding uh, or making an armature with one turn of coat hanger wire. The, pro the problem is that, you know, the uh, coat, hanger, coat hanger wire is so thick that there is no way that you could provide enough current for that thing to actually run. And none of the, none of the, um, of the components that we had at the time would have survived the heat of something like that. They, they go up in flames. We, we done it at Reeds for Christmas, for a Christmas fun night. Yeah. We've done, we done 24, 124th cars. I think we got three laps out of them before they, before they just burst into flames. Yeah, I'm sure. You're lucky. Or extinguish it already. Yeah. Now, Paul, did, did the driver get out okay? No. <laughs> it was toast. <laughs> I've got another topic to bring up if, we're, if we've beaten that horse into the ground. Uh -huh. um, I received an email earlier today. Somebody was asking me for advice on controllers. They saw my slot it video. They're like, yeah, that looks like a decent controller. What do you think about this, that, and the other thing? And I, I have to be honest with, with everybody here and everybody who's known me. I, I try not to make judgment calls about better versus worse with anything, but especially controllers because I've only used set controllers or the slot it controller. I've borrowed people's controllers from time to time, but I've never spent a lot of time with any other controller. So I had to be honest with him and say, sorry, I can't really give you a comparison between the slot it and this other controller you're asking about. So I'm going to ask you guys, has anybody here used for any extended period of time to formulate an opinion on it? The slotting plus Pro Evo, 100% electronic. <laughs> Apparently the dog has. Does that mean it's yeah. a dog? That would be a no from me. I've so, seen them. I've seen them, but I haven't used one. I, I have not, but I know a couple of guys who have used them, and they have been far from impressed. <laughs> it, it looked, I mean, when I first saw it, I'm like, okay, brake and sensitivity. It's a, it's an okay controller. You know, it's a professor motor, two knob controller. But then I looked at the instructions and no, it's definitely not just that. It's got dip switches and flip switches and their, their documentation said 40 throttle curves or something like that. It, just it seemed, this thing that is this the the, the, this the, the latest one? And the Thor's hammer. The big I don't meat. think it's the latest one because this site uh, is out of stock on it, and but they have uh, a new controller that supposedly is the new one, Pro Evo Two, hundred percent electronic. Yeah, but is this is this the replacement for that big green? It was called Thor's hammer around old. No, that was the advanced slot. No, that was the advanced slot. Ah, right, okay. Martin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Michael's got one, isn't he, Mister Malone? So nobody here has any experience with that other than Chris, his friends were not impressed by it? <laughs> um, the, the guys who have told me are, are, are pretty good race, pretty knowledgeable and pretty experienced. I would take their word for it, but I cannot say personally that, you know, based on what they have said out of the two controllers, I would go um, 
with the uh, Slotic controller, um, which I personally don't like. It doesn't fit my, it's just the handle shape is I don't like, but that's- That was the other thing I was gonna say is that, the, is that I've held a handle like that. Um, the DRS, um, the, the Carrera Digital from Digital Racing Solutions uses yeah. that same handle shape and it's very comfortable as compared to other handles that I've held. That was the only thing I could personally offer is it looks like it's got good ergonomics. Well, that's, I mean, like that's, the Alpama controllers. You know, no, they're, they're bigger than that. Are they? Yeah. The Slotting Plus, I think, uses the old Parma handle or a variation of a Parma handle, which has always been one of my favorites. Um, but that's my hand and, you know, that doesn't, don't, that means nothing for you. You got to pick it up and feel it and put it. Yeah, it, it that looks was... like a Palmer controller, but a, a Palmer handle, but it's a little longer in the in yeah. the where your hand is. Uh, yeah. So the rest of it actually, yeah. I think it is it not the same one that the DS controllers use. The DS, yeah, it's the DS. DS oh, yeah, uh -huh. DS and Digital Racing Solutions and, and Cobra and who? Yeah. Cobra. Cobra, yeah. It's a it's a good feeling handle and it's and, a very nice feeling handle. Yes, very very comfortable. It's, That's basically what it's I. Almost as nice as the new Defalco handle. So, so is, that, is, that a, is this a controller that can be used for analog and digital? No, it's analog. 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 analog only. So why does it have dip switches then? Because it's electronic. For the for right. what are called the curves for the sensitivity. Oh, I got you. Okay, sorry. So um, what's, the, what's the going Defalco these days? The Falco have a new handle. Uh, scroll that down a little and have a look. I can't see the, the rest of the thing down the bottom there. There, yeah. Um, that's, now the that's, old... that's still the old handle. Yeah. Yep. Well, that is still the old handle. That's new. That's new? That's interesting. It's, this, it's their scrolling the thing here. Does anybody know the name of the handle, the uh, name of the controller? Because I can just go to it in this. It's... Oh. Depends if he's upgraded his yeah. yeah, go into that 124 scale again and then go to uh yeah, 124 oh, controllers at the top of that one, yeah. Um old. Yeah, it's all old. Yeah. We're going to parts. Well, I would say yeah, go to, yeah, go to the parts piece. controller. Yeah. No, under 124 scale, go there and go down to parts and upgrades. Okay, okay. Yeah, there. Well, he's probably going to. Um... I don't see handle in here. Uh, I obviously Dennis has one. I've got a couple. Mm -hmm. um, they're a little longer. Um, I don't have a picture of mine. But that's, but that's not to say that, you know, he picks up a slot it and feels more comfortable with a slot it in. You, you can't. Yeah, and that's how I ended the email. I basically said, do what you can to get hands on with any controller that you're interested in yeah. or try to buy from a shop that lets you return it if you don't like it for any reason, because they're, they are such a personal thing. And, and he's, this is. Uh, yeah. Okay, if you want to put uh, start my video again, I've got that. Okay. Okay. You should be allowed to start it yourself, but um, no, it said no. Oh, no, you're... like blocked you. Okay. Yeah. Here, let's try that. Still telling me I can't do it. Uh, I didn't disallow you from starting video. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. It says to me. Well, I clicked on "Ask to Start Video" for you, and it should have popped up a thing that says, "Do you want to start your video?" Now it does. Yeah. There you go. Okay. All right, so uh, it it's not a lot different, right? Uh, it's basically it's it's longer in this dimension here, mm -hmm. so that your so that your hand, if you if you've got big hands like I have, they fit. Uh, a regular Palmer controller fits about there on my hand. Yeah, and so it's that, and then he's changed the top end a little bit, mm -hmm. not much. Uh, what for the for the the Falcos themselves? What is a big change is the way in which the board is fitted inside the controller, uh, because it's bolted down onto the onto the onto one side, 
And so you can lift the, the top cover right off. There's two screws there and one here. Those two screws don't go all the way through. This one has a, a, a nut on the other end, but you can basically lift that piece right off and you don't have to take the rest of the controller what apart the to, get at the, to, get at the, um, to get at the wiper and things like that. So uh, he's done a really nice job. It fits very well. It's got nice little um, uh, 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 fingers and keys along the, and slots along the side so that the two sides of the handle fit together very well. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's really very, very nice. And, and then the he's got in at the bottom up to the trigger that looks very much like a true speed. The cable, the shape yeah. of the trigger from, from, the, from the bottom of the controller where the cable goes in up to the trigger. Yeah, looks very much like a true speed. Well, oh, yeah. I mean, this the, the 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 piece that's in here, the, the the PC board that's in here is one of DeFalco's um, very early ones. I mean, I've had this controller uh, in various forms for oh, a number of years. Probably that that base that basic board is probably ten years old. Uh, the top end has been changed because it's the new thirty, the thirty band board. Um, the other thing that he's done now is, is created new triggers. This is the curved trigger, which which I prefer. Actually, I drive with that finger now. Um, but he has a straight trigger that looks just like a Palmer trigger, and then he has a longer one for people who like to who, who like to drive with two fingers. So you uh, and they all they all fit exactly where a Palmer used to fit. So uh, yeah, that's the that's the latest from DeFalco. So it's very similar in a way to the to the DS one in that it's basically uh, the same kind of feel as a Palmer, but just longer in the handle. Yeah, I've got a DS here, Dennis, and it's exactly the same. And that's got the little curve trigger too. But yeah, I've also got my Cobra, and I've uh, I've added it's it's the same body. It's the same body with the crenellations. I, I just put a uh, mountain bike in it to, to grip. But I've, I've put Sugradu or whatever you call that Japanese molding stuff to make this uh, a much longer trigger. So I can get too decent. I, I've got bloody big hands and bloody big fingers. So <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah I'm going to try this on next Wednesday when we start the club back. I'm actually going to try this after your suggestions two weeks ago. I changed out. I used to, I used to drive with my index finger, uh, but I've gotten some arthritis in the joint now and so it doesn't work too well so i had to retrain myself to use a middle finger and uh, despite all of my uh, protestations to the contrary over the years i actually drive quicker with this finger than i do with that work entropy is getting me so so this knuckle and this knuckle are both going now so yeah i'm even time with going left-handed wow I can't, I can't do it i can't do it left-handed because oh, that finger oh. doesn't that, that's as far as that finger bends. Paul, I Paul, that, Paul doesn't have a controller. That's a beer stein. What is that? <laughs> You're muted. You're muted, yeah. <laughs> You're still muted. <laughs> Where are you in the right. list? There hey. you go. Right. That is what I, that's the last controller oh. I used when oh. I raced. Oh. You got the old, uh, very cool. Haven't seen it lives, professor. It lives. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what, cool. what part of what part of Russia was it made in? Oh, no, this is uh, SCD. SCD. Oh, so it yeah. still races though. It's for for uh, vintage racing. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Oh, so Frankenstein. What the? You're a freak, Paul. <laughs> this expanding foam that was made. That's in. that's what my dad built. Yeah. What the heck is that? What to signal a naval fleet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's... I wish I, I'd say what, right? I used to luck because I used to get ahead. Like and no, just we, say, we, and we then we to an airport with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't fly with that. <laughs> is that why you got no hair on your forearm? Yeah. yeah it used to warm up, I tell you. That's why you got the big heat sink on the bottom. Wow. Yeah, you know, the websites that sell those things aren't necessarily allowed on the show. That was the very, very first controller. Yeah. Oh, those were great. So they warmed up and melted. And <laughs> those were nice. I like those. I had a few of those. 
Yeah. Well, enough about lovehoney.com. Let's move on. <laughs> I, I thought those Ravel controllers were weird, but that those were weird. <laughs> and look, well, the, the, yeah. All they are is evolved from all those. Another one. Oh. All converted, yeah. Yep. Yeah. An old MRC thumb controller converted with a Palmer, Palmer resistor at the bottom just to uh, to get the heat away from your hand. Yeah, just the way right, so that's, that's pr primarily to keep it cool, Dennis? Yeah. Yeah, well, not so much to keep the resistor cool, to keep your hand cool. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> it, did help, that it did help the resistor a bit, but primarily it was so that you could still hold the controller because they just got so hot. Yeah, there you go. But Paul, Paul, I think Queen Victoria wants her controller back. I'll, I'll tell you what. These were these were the rage in the eighties because mm -hmm. you could go, you could have a low resistor and a high resistor and you just throw the switch and you can go between both depending on what your quickest time was. Beautiful. And you got the old breaking micro switch at the bottom. You could also do some serious damage to somebody's face with that as well. Yeah. Is it steam powered? <laughs> So from the distant past to the near future, Kelly asked an interesting question, and I have my own personal opinion, but I've, any you guys, obviously, uh, he asked about 3D printed tires. Does anybody use them? If so, what type of filament uh, and for what type of track and car? Tires. Tires, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, no, you, you can print like a grippy type of material with 3D printing? Well, see, that's the thing, is you can print flexible material, but my experience with flexible material is that they are not grippy. Well, maybe they're good for for front tires then, no? But I, uh, that's that's what I was thinking. Front tires, probably okay. But I was also, because TPU and TPE are the two most common flexible filaments that a, that a filament printer can print with. TPU, thermoplastic polyurethane, as in polyurethane, uh, I'm, I've, I think that's the stuff that I have. I might have to give this a test, but I'm wondering to myself if I printed it and then mounted it and trued it, would that new trued surface have any grip to it? Because the material straight off, straight off the printer is shiny and smooth and slippery. It's not gonna have any grip. Great for front tires, but, not, but terrible unless you wanna do a rally car on an ice track for back tires. I think that'd be a good project for you, Greg. Sounds like it. <laughs> Actually, you know what, though? It would, it would be a great way to simulate a rain race or a wet race. In fact, that was that was something that came up uh, with some other conversation I had with somebody. One, one of the guys yeah, in my Mitch info club. Um, Mitch Hodge did a set of tires. Um, they did presets. Um, you could buy them individually or, or with a packet. And it also came with a die. Um, so, for example, I think there was grey, black, and blue. The blue was rain, so obviously there was two um, sides of the die had sort of um, rain, rain on them. Um, two sides was snow, and then um, for one of the tyres, and I can't remember what the other one was. But um, yeah, as I say, it's been done. Uh, going back to the 3D printed tyres, I've seen on some of the Spanish sites um, there's already companies selling 3D tyres to go on the fronts. Um, you know, rubber tires coat it with varnish if you're allowed to. Um, you know, why reinvent the wheel? <laughs> no pun intended. Well, I, I mean, I'm gonna have to <laughs> at this point, I'm gonna have since I have the material, I can I can I can easily print out a set yeah. of tires to slot it tight yeah. back and see yeah. see what happens when I glue and true them if they become grippy. I don't think they will if I can even successfully true them without turning them into mush. But one of the just on the park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they flexible to get on a, a wheel rim? Oh yeah. The, the, surprisingly, the flexible material has some of the best layer to layer adhesion as any other material. So I'll be able to print out a tire and smoosh it and stretch it all I want and I've it'll got go. a better idea. Yeah. Use it for wings. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rear wings. You're going to it's sell more rear wings than you are tires. Yeah, but it's also notoriously hard to print and um, almost impossible to do stuff that needs supports because it sticks so well to itself 
that when you're printing it on supports made of TPU, the supports are not going to come off. So you basically have to design it to, to cut away the supports with the scissors or something like that. That could work, but I'm going to try the tire thing. And, and I, one of the guys in my club has a set of rally cars, four wheel drive rally cars that he puts shrink, shrink tubing onto the tires in order to reduce the grip because putting super glue wears off after enough laps. So he has, he doesn't want to have to re super glue his tires. And then, so he did shrink wrap on the tires. And I'm thinking, well, if this TPU printed tires have terrible grip, no matter what, they'll be perfect for his <laughs> ice rally yeah. cars, which is basically what. Why not just get a roll of scotch tape? Right. Because it, it'll all wear, right? It needs to have tires that don't get better traction when they wear down. <laughs> um, It'd be like a tear visor. It, each, each layer just tear itself off. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to give that a try. I don't, Kelly, I don't think that that there is such a material that provides ample grip for any suitable slot car tire other than fronts where grip is not desired. Now, now could you also use the material for what Chris was talking about? He, he makes those dampening donut things yeah. for his uh, chassis. Would, would that be good for that? No. Maybe, but I don't think it's got enough squish yeah. um, to, to suitably do that. It could, uh, 3D printing is, is not a bad thing to use, especially in a resin printer as something to then mold and then cast urethane tires off of. So you're not having to do a, you know, turn an aluminum rod into a tire and then cast that. You could print a resin wheel or tire or whatever and then cast that instead. I wouldn't yeah, do it. You could also, I'm, I'm sure you could also print sidewall detail as well, right? Especially on the resin printer. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that on the filament printer with the flexible filament. I, I mean, if, if somebody said, "Hey, Greg, can you do tires?" and I was interested, I would definitely print, print the originals on their resin printer and then cast that and pour actual urethane or silicone or whatever material I wanted to pour. Mm. That's just my opinion. We got a few minutes. Anybody else got it? Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, good morning. I'm, I've got a note for being late, so uh, don't worry about it, fellas. So, um, well, let's see it. Want... <laughs> oh. Was it signed by both sets of parents? <laughs> Will ten dollars do? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just re no no pun intended, but just rewinding a bit to the controller discussion. I've got a one of the DS Pro Speed zero zero eight four Bs or something like that, and I'm in the notes you get with it. It says, um, if you're racing on a track with an external braking system, don't use this controller. Now, I, I run on one one track I run on, and I've um, has got uh, you know, like a little um, rear stat control for people who have controllers without brakes, and they can t adjust the brakes back and forward. Now, I'm I'm wondering if I use my tr uh, true speed. Am I going to blow it up? And I'm, I'm reluctant to blow up two hundred dollars worth of controller. Um, I use a Professor motor on that at that particular track, but um, I'm just wondering if you know if the assembled wisdom of the chat would know anything about whether whether I'm likely to you know to blow up my my uh, DS84 um, by hooking it into a track that's got a, a variable braking supply on it. I would say no. Uh, as long as whatever they've wired into the track is just a rear stack, because <laughs> then that looks like what is in the what is in the controllers anyway. I think what they're referring to is tracks that may have uh, some kind of reverse voltage or uh, something else as a as a, a braking assist. Uh, if that was the case, then yes, you're going to have problems <clears throat> with uh, with any transistorized controller feeding voltage back in the wrong way around. Yeah. Um, but if it's just a if it's just a, a, a variable resistor in the in the uh, brake line, um, then I can't see that there would be any problem. Yeah, it's, it's just a small rotary switch, Dennis. So I assume it's nothing. Yeah, I would nothing check with too I vicious, would check yeah. with them first to find out if it's a rotary switch. Then maybe there's diodes on on the rotary switch, yeah. uh, which 
also would not give should not cause a problem. Right. And you're 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 using the Professor Motor controller on that track then? Yeah, yes, Chris. And there's no issues with that? No. Then I would suspect you wouldn't have I would suspect I'm not gonna I'm not gonna buy you a new controller if you blow it up, but I would suspect you'd be absolutely fine with the other one. Yeah, I would agree with you. Obviously using yeah. other controllers as well though, aren't they? Then Sorry? Yeah, yeah, but, um yeah, I mean most of them are using a slotted. Um, I think slot is the most prominent brand. So um, well, then, yeah, then it's, it's going to be no then problem. Be fine. That that yeah. thing's yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just that mine mine runs on what they call pulse modulation or something like that. Pulse switch modulation, modulation. Yeah. Pulse, pulse switch modulation. Slot it, yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, so slot it works basically. It's, it's all electronic, Chris. So right. So, so, yeah, it's yeah. also a PWM. Yeah. 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 Really if the right. slot it works, cool. then so will the true speed. Yeah, if, um, if, if guys are running slotted controllers, those are the most finicky, bloody things known to man. So if they work fine on that track, you'll, you'll be completely fine with yours. Yeah. Okay, thank you. you. If, if I could just rewind a little bit further to the, um, the talk about selecting motors and- um, Hold on, hold on. Nick, did you have something you wanted to contribute on that controller? Um, just, just something to do with the um, controllers with the- um, uh, electronic gubbins in uh, PWMs. We found at Rockingham, because our main track is you can just flick a switch and reverse the direction. And we found that a couple of people were blowing the controllers and we, we couldn't really figure out why. And then, then we figured out that every time the controller blew, we flicked the direction of the control of the track. So now we have to make sure everybody's got the controllers unplugged because we switch direction every six weeks, whatever it is. When we've done the full cycle of the classes, we change direction. So when we change the track direction, you have to make sure everybody's controllers are unplugged, change direction, <laughs> plug them back in. I'm Outside. guessing that, that during the switch over, there's some kind of momentary short that happens oh, yeah. during the yeah. switch. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's a good rule of thumb. That, Anytime that was, you're... Enough. Anytime you're changing anything to do with the power functionality of the track, don't have your controller yeah. hooked up. Don't have anything plugged in there. Yeah. Or the power switched on for that matter. Yeah. And you yeah, wanted to... Well, we, yeah, we don't have reverse... The trouble um, is it's a, it's a uh, proper power supply as well. It's about 160 amps, isn't it, Nick? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a it's, big old It's something you know. the raceway as well, so... Yeah. You know. Pretty much kill something instantaneously. <laughs> or create life. Could use it to create life, even. <laughs> And you were going to ask about uh, motors, Big Ben? Yeah, I was just going to offer offer a comment. You know, um, Chris earlier said, you know, if you could get hold of the motors at the shop, you're buying them, and um, you know, just uh, wiggle the wiggle the yeah. We, we we sort of wondered why about thirty years of the commercial raceway that was operating um, then, why every new motor we bought the packet had little crinkles in it, and what was happening was that the track owner who was a ferocious competitor. He was twisting the pinions, you know, by, didn't take the, the motors out of the packet. He twisted the pinions to see which ones had the best magnets. And so all the, um, all the, the, new, the new motors allegedly were, were crinkled where he'd been testing to see which one was the, uh, well, in his opinion, anyway, the strongest. Though. That's, that's a very scientific way to do it. Eh, feels stronger. <laughs> I'll put that one on this pile. Eh, feels weaker. I'll put that one on that pile. <laughs> He, he, he was the he was the guy who the, the young guys would say, "Oh, my car's not handling well." Oh and yeah. He said, oh yeah, and he'd, you know, he'd fix it, he'd make it handle, but you know they, they probably didn't have the same motor in when they got it back. As... Yeah. Okay, that'll do me then. I found a I found a, a DS controller handle and the the uh, what's his name handle. Okay. The the Falco handle, so I can show you to you, show them to you next to each other. Uh, yeah. oh, there we go. So there's a little bit of difference up the top in, in the shape. Uh, there's more difference in the shape here. This uh, the 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 Falco is a little straighter there, and it's just a couple of millimeters longer. Uh, the De Falco than the DS. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the. The two handle shapes are very similar, but not exactly the same. 
Yeah. Both very comfortable. And yeah, same matter, with the triggers, right? both very comfortable. Yeah, for, for that matter, on controllers, depending what the guys want to do, um, you know, dollar for dollar, it's pretty bloody hard to beat a professor motor controller for, you know, average running if you're not, you know, in top competition stuff. They're great things. Yeah, that's basically what I was about to tell him was when I thought that slotting plus one was basically a two knob controller, I was going to say, you know, why pay 240 for uh, for that thing when you can pay one 120 for a two knob Professor Motor? <laughs> but he was going to ask, he was going to ask if Professor Motor would discount it because apparently they've been in stock for a long time. I'm like, yeah, probably not that much. <laughs> I don't know them to be discounting things very often, you know, but. And Andy's uh, Andy doesn't like to give away money. Yeah, you know, if if I'm sure he's got, I don't know what the what the markup is on that kind of thing, but probably not as much as you'd think. But yeah, so get it in hand, test it, see if you like it, then buy it. <laughs> exactly. Just borrow one from a friend and try it, and whatever you like, buy it. Like they're all good. <laughs> Um, you know, they all work slightly differently, but they're all good. And at the end of the day, if your finger doesn't work, the controller is not going to do much for you. Yeah. You can have all the bells and whistles on the controller, but it's still your finger that makes the car go and stop. Yeah. <laughs> they do that. Look, I've got a car stone, and that's just as bad. That's a nightmare to figure out how to drive. And yeah, and that's why I did the video on the slotted controller because I've been using it long enough to to be able to kind of give people the lay of the land on on how to get started with it. And and my opinion is that the slotted is a really good bang for the buck controller as well because you do that have was very useful, Greg. What's the, that? Um, that was very useful, Greg, for the um, oxygen races that we do. Um, I've I've often sometimes thought that like the garage twenty seven car doesn't accelerate quite as fast as a lot of the cars around it and watching your video and i've got my controller out and just put it on a piece of test track I have, it, it was just literally the the finding the um how much you move the controller before the car moves just a silly little thing like that that i'd overlooked and yeah. i really think that's going to make a difference so yeah and, and and I wish there was I wish there was some way that I could convey the 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 middle of the trigger when I'm changing things like the curve max or the the knob the switch on top and stuff like that because it's easy to show min speed and it's easy to show the power trim and it's easy to show braking and stuff like that but it's really hard to convey over video no matter how much I talk about it how the car feels in the turns when my trigger is somewhere in the middle. Uh, and, and, you know, I can say, well, I'm driving around this turn and when I have the, the curve max knob down, it's, it feels sluggish, but then when I turn it up, it, you know, it's got, you know, the, the better cornering feel, right? It's, <laughs> it's feel, right? You got to yeah. feel it. So. And everybody drives differently as and well. Everybody drives differently. Yeah. yeah. I can't say set your controller here and it'll be better for you. I'd say, <laughs> where I use it, play around, and you know, as long as you know at least the the basic reason behind the knobs, if not necessarily the technical explanation for what they do, what their <clears throat> what their basic functionality what, what is. Knob, what's what? Yeah. yeah, don't be turning the yellow knob when you mean to be turning the blue knob. <laughs> don't don't be turning the yellow knob all the way up thinking it's going to change something else on the trigger pattern than than the the min speed, right? But yeah, I, that's why I made the video. Hopefully, it's helpful. So I'm glad that you were helped by it. And we're running down to the last few seconds here of the recording. Does anybody else they have anything they want to chime back in on? Go ahead, Paul. I'm on mine. I'm I'm on my track. I want to run it one way and run it the other way. And now I've got all true speeds on mine. So will that affect it running the opposite way? Depends on how you wired things up. If, you're, if your polarity switch is between your power supply and your controller, you don't know what's gonna happen. If your polarity it's switch not, is between your controller and the track, then it's fine, doesn't matter, just flip it. The polarity switch needs to be between the track and between the, the, the track and the car or between the, what did you say? 
between the controller hookup, the output of the controller. Between the hookup, yeah, between the hookup and the, the track. Between the hookup and the and the braid. Nowhere else. Yeah. Otherwise you're gonna be in all kinds of trouble. Yep. Do you already have a polarity switch on your track, Paul? No, not yet. Yeah, that's that's where to put it. Just get a, a two pull three or double double pull, double throw. Double pull, double throw. Switch. And then you basically do you know, it's center and then an X pattern to basically flip the polarity and yeah, there's there's diagrams all over the internet, but put yeah, that, pull it. Just that wire I'll put it your controller, at your, here's your controller, here's your switch, here's your track. That's that's where Paul, you Michael Maloney's done a really, really good diagram. I'll send it to you. All right, cheers, mate. Yeah, just don't wire the um, polarity changeover where your controller is. Yeah. That, and, you, and you'll be safe, but just make sure you unplug the controller when you change the direction just to be on the safe side. Better safe than sorry. The power and, is on. And, and on that note, better safe than sorry. I don't we'll think stop the dinosaur ones, will it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hit the stop button. And for everybody who's not coming live, come live, enjoy the chat. Talk to you later. See you next week. Bye.